This is a production of Cornell University. Basically, I'm going to kind of give you a tour of some of the things that we've done for the Climate Center, try to relate them back to agriculture and, and, and things where, where there might be some interest in the types of things that you guys do. So if I can get my slides to advance, which they're not doing right off the top here. This way. All right. So first off, what's the Climate Center? What's the Northeast Climate Center? We're one of six of these centers that exist across the country. Um, We've been here at Cornell for a long time, actually kind of an antidote. When I was a grad student, you can kind of figure out way back when at Rutgers, actually the Climate Center funded my research. So kind of came full circle. Um, but the idea here behind the Climate Center is NOAA collects a lot of data. They have a lot of weather forecasts. And the idea why NOAA pays us to do what we do is how can we take their data and make it the most useful to people? So kind of our little tagline there is taking data and turning it into information. And we do that in a number of ways. So kind of the first, I'm gonna call it kind of case study that I'm gonna talk about should be very familiar to Harold because it actually goes back to the work that uh, Harold and I did back in the adapt end days when we were here in Bradfield. And really um, what the main focus of that work was, was to create a high resolution data set. So we, it was an integral part of adapt end but it is also an integral part of kind of what we do day to day in a number of different applications. So really the, the idea here is the, the red dots there, which I think got moved around on my map are where weather stations are. So if I just look at New York state, there's probably about 200, 250 weather stations that report each day, okay? And obviously there's a lot that goes on in between them. So our kind of classic problem is how do we take the data that are collected at these stations, at these red dots, and figure out what it does in your field or my field or something like that. Not if I'm a research field, but if I'm a grower or something like that. And there's really no lack of solutions to this, right? Most of it is, is statistical. You can create, you can do uh, different types of, of, of spatial weighting and things like that. You can go into machine learning. Um, you know, Basically the one uh, method that's used quite extensively in our field is this regression based interpolation. The acronym for the data set is called PRISM. And it's, it's about a four kilometer grid across the country. Um, would have been very useful for us, but our one problem is it takes time to process these data. So like PRISM is not available till like about two days from now. And if I'm a grower and I need to make a decision today or tomorrow, kind of need the information today or tomorrow. So we kind of developed this method as a way of, of kind of getting a jump on things. So really what do we do for temperature? We use short-term weather forecasts as kind of our data set, but then we take these stations and we use that to ground truth the weather or forecast. So the forecast is on a very fine grid. It knows about the Finger Lakes, it knows about the topography, it knows whether the soil is wet or dry and things like that. So it really brings in a lot of physical parameters. But I think we all know here a weather forecast isn't 100% accurate, close, but not quite. Um, so we then bring in the observations to kind of hold that weather forecast um, accurate, uh, you know, kind of hold it as ground truth and then use that bias as a way of adjusting the forecast. For rainfall, we do the same thing, but with radar, right? We all can go on our app and see, you know, it's raining and and figure out how much it rained from the app. But again, there's some problems with the radar. It's not 100% accurate. So we use the, the gauges to keep it honest. Um, so I think I pretty much said all of that. So um, move on. So really, how does this work? So if I'm looking at the forecast model that we're using for temperature, um, you know, there's a whole slew, a whole range of observations that would come in, you know, if, if I'm making this forecast, I bring them in. It could be satellites, it could be weather balloons, it could be radar, it could be observations. Um, you know, so any number of, of things come into this observation. And in, in our lingo, what's called, there's a process that's called data assimilation, kind of bringing in all these desperate, disparate sources of, of information, kind of correcting further biases and peculiarities. And eventually what happens there is we get an analysis. And what the analysis is, is nothing more than the starting point of the weather forecast, right? Weather forecasts are big, complex mathematical models. 
and they need to start from someplace. So this analysis is kind of a snapshot of what it is to start this forecast. Um, and then that goes into the model and the model comes out and makes the forecast, right? So that's kind of the, the thing. The one other piece of this is then actually the forecast gets fed back into the data analysis, right? So if I'm, this model that we use is an hourly model, it forecasts every hour. So the forecast I made last hour or two hours ago or even three hours ago isn't that far off and that provides some information. Um, and it's basically this forecast that we're using to guide our interpolation between the stations. I should also, you know, I did also mention all of the things that come in to the forecast model in terms of the landscape and the hydrology and in, in addition to the meteorology. Um, the grid density of these models is we're really using a 25 kilometer grid now on the land surface. Um, one of the key things we do is if you think of each of these, the circles with the TGs in them as a grid in the model, we want to compute a bias. We want to know how far off the model is from the station. So we have to do, or one of what the first thing we have to do is get this station, which might be at a different elevation and might be at a different spot, coincident with the station, right? I know what the temperature here is at the station, and I want to see what is the difference from the grid. So we do two things. The first thing is to bring this grid point down to the same elevation as the station. So we correct for elevation. And a nice thing about using a meteorological model is it's not just flat on the land, but it also tells us what's going on up vertically in the atmosphere. So we can use the model's lapse rate. That's what I'm showing here is this blue line, how temperature varies in the atmosphere on this particular day or this particular hour to bring this grid point back down to the station elevation. Kind of a, a double duty kind of um, interpolation, so to speak. This kind of physical interpolation to account for elevation and then a statistical interpolation to account for how far off we are from the station. Um, so again, that spatial interpolation uh, kind of used two different methods. Really the first method we use to go from grids to stations is a spline-based method, multi-quadric. We look for a radius of influence around the station. So my X's here are stations. So I bring in a lot of grid points around that station. Um, you know, this, this circle, this radius of influence, kind of some sensitivity analysis to see, you know, once you get beyond about 0 0.8, 0 0.9 kilometers in radius, it doesn't really matter in this example here for Syracuse. Um, so these are, you know, this station, this grid point here is, is weighted heavier than this point here, but all of these influence the interpolation. And then uh, once we do that, at each of the station locations, we have a bias. So this would be an example of the bias field that we've interpolated to the stations each day. And these are in, de these are in K or, or degree C. So, you know, you can see in these blue and purple areas about a degree, a degree and a half low, um, you know, maybe about, you know, two, two and a half degrees in some spots. So um, the, the bias field comes into play here at each of the stations. And then this is interpolated back to the grid points to adjust them uh, based on the station. And that gives us a nice, I think my last one. Oh, nope, one other thing. Um, we're working in this model at 20 kilometers. We'd really like to have a finer resolution. So what we do in that case is um, from the bias field that we've computed, uh, we go back to the uh, model grid points. And now instead of interpolating them vertically and horizontally um, to the stations, we do that to a, uh, a five kilometer digital elevation model. So we're choosing this kind of elevation in the landscape as being analogous to stations. We're interpolating the model to those. And then we take that bias field that we uh, computed and bring that back to this five kilometer grid now. So the same type of process, but uh, with a different grid spacing there. And again, the five kilometer digital elevation model is being adjusted based on the, the model uh, lapse rates. So this would be an example of kind of what we get at the end. We just used the observations and did some kind of inverse distance weighting or something to, to contour it. Uh, on this day, we'd have a pattern that looks like that. And if your eyes aren't uh, very good, which they probably aren't, and I don't know where the pointer went in my pocket neighbor. It is. 
Um, that's the southern shore of Lake Ontario. So we're probably about right here in this, in this pattern. And if you come here, I think if you squint your eyes and kind of maybe turn your head a little bit, you kind of see the Finger Lakes in there. So the temperature pattern of the Finger Lakes showing up on this day as being a little bit warmer. It's a March day um, than, than the surrounding landscape. So you get a kind of a feel for how we can get more of the spatial detail and temperature. Precipitation, we do the same thing more or less. It's with radar. Um, it's already on a four kilometer grid. So when we get data from the radar, it's on a four kilometer grid. Each pixel is four kilometers square. Um, we find those pixels that overlap or are co-located co with a rain gauge, compute the bias, and then just inverse distance weight that bias back to uh, each of the grid points. And we get a precipitation map. So again, this is just station data. And here's some more fine scale detail uh, when we're using the radar data. So maybe if you key in on this area here in Eastern Pennsylvania, where the rainfall totals were kind of over a hundred millimeters in this kind of purple-ish, bluish area here. And you really have no, you know, no, no trace of that in the, with just using the observation. So these high totals missed all of the rain gauges. Um, we kind of look at some validation statistics, um, lots of numbers, but the, the reds are the best. And basically the NRCC is us. So it's good to see a lot of the reds in our column across either winter or summer and over a range of precipitation amounts in millimeters. Only the low amounts in the summertime does the radar itself do better. So the rate, we can get these <laughs> estimates from radar, but the radar has bias in it. it you know, especially maybe on a day like this when there's freezing, the, the, the snowflakes reflect differently than the raindrops. And if they're melting, it, it really messes things up. Um, so how do we use this? Uh, so this is a web app that we have called Climate Smart Farming. Um, basically, the first thing you would do is come in and be presented with a map. And you can drop a pin someplace. And I could have picked Ithaca, but I guess I picked someplace in the boondocks of Portland County to kind of maybe show a point. Um, I click there and uh, what this tool does is look at degree days. And um, our gridded data set that we've done, we've actually done it retroactively. So we have over 30 years of this type of temperature grid for the landscape. So um, not a very good, not a very useful example, at least in real time, since I did it for this year, um, right? But the way the tool would work is the green line would show the accumulation of degree days season to date at that point based on our data set. The little red nib there at the end is a forecast of degree days out for the next five days from a forecast model. Um, not, not the same one we use, but basically a weather service forecast. And then kind of all of the neat, I think, climatological data relies here. So basically we have this kind of gray band and what that is, is the period of record range from our data set. So for this grid point in Cortland County, New York, um, you know, pick your favorite date, the 4th of July, and the most degree days that ever accumulated there were a little over 800, the least were a little under 500. Uh, the two lines, blue and purple, represent a 15 in blue and a 30 year average, the last 15 and 30 years. Um, Anything strike anybody about that 15 and 30 year average? Gosh, the yeah, the 15 year average is higher. Why is that? Something called climate change maybe, right? So, I mean, this is a key of this tool to say, hey, for some reason as climatologists, we always use the 30 year average and the 30 year average ain't the right thing to use anymore. Basically a 15 year average is a better way of looking at things. And I think this demonstrates that quite closely that you know you might be here the end of September and yeah, in the 30 year average expecting about 2000 and you're really up around 22 or 2400. Um, so that's that. And then all of these bars here um, represent the first and last frost dates, all right? So the idea of if we're using this tool to figure out planting or something like that, I want to know, well, when, sh when should I really be planting? I can change my planting date to basically minimize my corn getting zapped by frost in the spring. 
again, the light blue lines are the period of record and the darker blue lines are the last 15 years. So again, you can kind of see maybe the darker blue lines are to that part of the graph, again, bringing in that idea of climate change. And then, so that can be used for planting in the spring, but really what a lot of people use this tool for is, is looking here at the end of the season and saying, boy, I'm really going kind of slow. Am I ever going to get enough degree days to meet maturity or do what I have to do? Again, I'm not the agronomist um, before I have a risk of frost. Okay, so kind of right here, a nice climatology of the growing season kind of at a push of a button. Um, we also do something similar for uh, fall cover, cover crops, again, based on the climatology. So um, this is, is buckwheat. And basically here, um, it says, um, it basically goes from any day, now this is all climatology, nothing, uh, nothing for our current growing season here, but basically it says based on the climatology, again, 15 year, um, 30 year and period of record. So 15 year, 30 year period of record. Again, you see that climate change in there. They're, they're, they're nice and, and spread apart. If I planted my buckwheat as a cover crop on say August 13th, it would have a 73% uh, probability chance of maturing before the last frost basically is the way that would work. You can kind of see in which years you made it to that threshold of degree days that you would need uh, in the blue and not in the red. Any questions on that? All right. So the other thing, gonna shift gears. Um, the other thing we do is work a lot with weather stations. And we do this actually most use with the integrated pest management program in New York, uh, a group called NUA, nua.cornell.edu, um, mainly fruit crops. Um, kind of, it, even though it's New York IPM, it has a pretty wide footprint. Um, you know, New York, New England, down into New Jersey, down into the Carolinas, out to Minnesota. I think there's about a handful of stations in Utah, um, some in Nebraska. So it's, it's a widespread network, uh, all of very similar weather stations. And that's important because that allows us to grab the weather. We don't have to go to you and grab the data from your weather station and Tony and grab his. It's kind of all um, more or less consistent. Okay. Um, we basically just did a lot of web development work on it to make it mobile responsive, to clean up the design, um, to make it customizable. Um, you can come in and say, hey, remember where I am, remember when I planted my stuff, so you don't have to enter in all those parameters each time. Um, I guess I did want to say, I want to point out, even though it's mostly fruit, um, the, the new person that's directing NUA has really been expanding to field crops as well. So I think that's something you'll see coming into play. And the way we've designed this, in both the, the software and the coding, is for it to be really, really nimble. So if something comes up quickly and it's really just, you know, it's degree day based or uses the data that we can have, we can, journ, we can gin up and turn out a new model pretty quickly. So a good example of that is seed cord maggot. And again, I'm not the, I'm not the agronomist, but I guess New York is basically looking to outlaw or ban a certain chemical that's used to treat seed corn. And so this is, is, this is something that they developed with us in, in response to that. Um, so a lot of data flow and our data system is called ACES. So basically what this is saying is kind of looking at the data system, right? We have data coming in from a number of disparate sources, right? The newest stations, which are uh, Kestrel instruments, um, another group of instruments that are onset. So uh, basically those are coming in. Uh, weather service data, our own data from, from our farms here. Um, we bring in data from a statewide network in Michigan, another statewide network in Delaware. So again, a number of different networks, but with the key thing, I'm not going to individual growers and getting their data, right? The growers have to kind of buy in and say, yep, I'm going to get this kind of weather station and that data all goes to a central point. Um, and then basically the way it works is that data is stored in our repository. Um, we're basically an operational place. So I can't afford to have my servers go down one day 
in the middle of the growing season, like when the apple farmers are looking to spray for fire blight or something like that. So I have a number of redundant repositories. Uh, basically, we're doing this all on the cloud now with um, load sharing and things like that. So if a request comes in and it tries to hit the server here and we're down or we're busy, it knows where to go to look for another server on uh, AWS. We used to do this with our own kind of hardware and things like that. And we still have one set of servers that are, but increasingly it's all on the cloud. Um, and then through the power of you know, the web service that ASIS is, the data can then be queried by these centralized models and, and spit out something for a user. So yeah, a bad slide again, but again, just to give you an idea of how our data system works, um, basically a lot of code here, but the thing to boil down is I'm making this, this is really, if we focus in on here, I'm making the request. I'm picking a station. I happen to pick Minneapolis for some reason, a date range. And I'm saying, hey, I want to know minimum temperature. And I want to know basically um, the last date in a year that it got to 28 degrees. All right. So a frost application. So I'm kind of setting it up, you know, a bunch of code here, but obviously I want min temperature. I want the last date. It's less than or equal to 28. I want it to tell me the day. So that's what that add value is. Um, so I set up this, this set of parameters. I make a request to the server. And within milliseconds, it'll spit back the results for this. Looks like I'm asking for at least a, what, a, a 10 year or so period. That in 1992, um, you know, on 630, or no, from in 1992, the last temperature below 28 was actually a 17 in April. Um, 27 in April, and, and you can go down. So a very quick query of not just the data, but the information, right? I'm not asking for minimum temperatures. I want to know when the frost is. Um, we can do this with our gridded data. So same type of thing. I've asked for, um, I'm in Vermont, and I want to know in each county in each year, what was the coldest minimum temperature? Um, so again, all those grids, it knows where the counties are. And we can get that response back. In this case, I think I just asked for a single year. Um, so actually a single day, leap day. Um, so a minus 24 in that county, a minus 26 in that county. You get the idea. Um, it can also do our mapping directly. So, um, And so the way this has worked, we use it for NUA, but it's out there and freely available. This is a group at Purdue that has a very similar degree day calculator. We have nothing to do with it other than our API is open for them to grab the data. So we're providing the operational feed for somebody else's model. Um, what we'd really like to do is, you know, it, it'd be nice if there could be a bunch of different products and really what our system does gives you data in different formats. So you don't right now, if you're using it, you, you have to be kind of say, yep, this is the way art gives me the data back. It's standardized. And, and you can, you know, you basically have to deal with this. But if you have your own model that you want to do something else, maybe you've developed it in house and you're expecting data to come in in one way, but you want to use it in the next state, it'd be nice to be able to kind of uh, format our data to be used in a different application. Um, you know, this system, again, used in ag, uh, the weather service uses it, um, the USDA uses it. Uh, scan, anyone know about the SCAN network in USDA, right? That's their soil climate uh, access network. Again, their data come into our database, a number of different things. Um, the other thing we do, again, this is another of our models, but I want to focus in on this kind of end period here. What do we do for the forecast, right? Any of these tools, especially where we're using to make real-time decisions, it's nice to know what's going on today but everyone wants to know what's going to happen, right? They're not going to make a decision based on what has happened. They want to know what's going to happen in the next couple of days. So we do bring in a forecast. Um, so this is a, an Apple freeze tool, uh, recent data. Basically, these are minimum temperatures in the forecast. And the kind of yellowy, orangey line is, uh, at least right now, at what temperature we'd expect 50% of the blossoms to be killed. So, so far, so good. But if it keeps staying warm, uh, we might be in some problems. Um, so what do we use? We use a weather service product. It's a gridded forecast called the NDFD, the National Digital Forecast Database. Um, 
its hourly database, um, two and a half kilometer resolution, goes out to eh, its hourly to 72 hours, but actually goes out about seven days at either three hour or six hour uh, resolution. Where am I, what time am I shooting for? Okay. Um, so, um, and the, so that's a, that's a ready, nice off the shelf product that we can just grab from the weather service. But in kind of our research application here, we said, hmm, how about if we ran our own weather forecasting model in, well, I guess it started when we were in Bradfield, but now we're in Snee. So in Snee Hall or in Rhodes Hall or on the clouds, could we do better than the weather service does for predicting the weather in, in the areas that we're, we're looking at? So the, the, uh, the kind of the, the weather model de jure on this regional scale is called the, the WERF, the Weather Research and Forecast Model. Um, you know, we can run it in-house, we can run it on the cloud, we actually do both. Um, the neat thing is we can run this model at whatever spatial resolution we want. So we can do it at 32 kilometers, nine kilometers, three kilometers. We can even crank it, I've seen people crank it down to less than one kilometer. And I probably have swampland in Florida that I could sell them because I'm not quite sure that, yeah, I think you're really, if you can, if you can believe one side of the football field versus the other side of the football field, um, I'm not quite sure about that. So uh, we chose to use these three spatial resolutions. Um, the other thing that um, is kind of the, the latest in, in weather forecasting is to run the models as an ensemble, all right? So not just run the model once and say, yep, this is what the temperature is going to be, but actually run many simulations of the model. They all basically are starting from the same initial, they can start from the same initial conditions, and perhaps just be have some differences in how the physics might be parameterized in the model, not the not the main you know equation of state and those kinds of physics, but you know how do we handle soil moisture in this one, or how do we handle convection in that one? The kinds of things where you need to parameterize the model a little bit, and I might do it one way, and Harold might do it another way, and somebody else might do it a third way. We're all right, there is no right answer, but we've chosen to do things differently. And obviously our models spit out different answers. So that's one way of getting these ensembles. The other way is to take the initial conditions and just perturb them a little bit, add a little bit of random error to it. Right? I really don't know what the initial conditions are. So if I'm off by a little bit, what would that do to my model? So in this case, that's what we're doing. Uh, same model, same forecast, but I know, I guess it's nine different, it looks like more than that actually. Each of these lines, these light blue lines, is a realization, one of the members of the ensemble, right? So uh, cleverly, we call these spaghetti diagrams because they look like spaghetti. And you can see, you know, some of the models, if this is temperature, are up here someplace. Others are down here. Uh, there's a good cluster of them here in the middle. The red is the ensemble median, right? So if I take the average of all of these, but really, yeah, these all cluster together and stuff, but there's really no reason to say, yeah, those are the best. I mean, there's, there's nothing to say that. They might be all wrong for the right. They all might be wrong for the same reason, but they're still wrong, basically. Um, and if you kind of look at the distribution, it's not all that, you know, we expect temperature, maybe we'd want it, or we're, we're assuming it's nice and normally distributed. But really out here, we have something that's multimodal. Yeah, most of them fall in here, but there's this, several of them are saying it's gonna be cold, several of them are saying it's gonna be warm. So it's basically where I wanna go with this is, is after we've done this ensemble of forecasts, we post-process process them to get an idea of what the errors are, and then use that post-processing to adjust the newest forecast. Um, so as an example, um, if the black line is reality, that's my observation, and I have several ensemble members here in the blue, that's what they're saying the temperature is. And um, you know, in this case, really just look at the lines. I have the observation here at somewhere between zero and one degree. Um, the ensemble median or mean is somewhere here at negative 0.5. So normally I would say, yep, I'm gonna make this as my forecast and I'm gonna be off by that amount but I'm really not taking into account any of this other information about the ensemble spread. Um, 
<clears throat> so a, a complicated graph, but basically how we do our post-processing is, right, I need to know the difference between what it really is and what the model is saying. And obviously I can't do that today or it isn't much of a forecast, right? So we look back 27 days or 25 days and really get a distribution of all of these biases. And without going into the statistics, if I just looked at the raw ensemble, I'd get this blue curve. But if I did some kind of uh, my post-processing here in the orange curve, the, the best way I can describe it, it's kind of like doing a regression on the distribution, right? So I'm changing the spread, I'm changing the, um, I'm altering the spread, I'm altering the mean, and I have now this new probability distribution that I can add to the forecast. Also, my forecast then isn't, yep, it's going to be 20, oh, what's tomorrow? Tomorrow's Friday. Nope, it's going to be 32 tomorrow, okay? I'm going to say there's some distribution of temperature tomorrow, right, based on adjusting uh, the probability distribution, adjusting the ensemble uh, based on its, its past bias. Um, so we did our little study area in kind of three regions of New York. Again, we were working with NUA on this, so it's not surprising the fruit regions in the Finger Lakes and Lake Erie and out here on Long Island. Um, and uh, a bunch of different results here, and I'll walk you through them actually pretty quickly. Um, solar radiation, humidity, and temperature. Um, basically, what we're showing here is the first two bars in the case of solar radiation are the raw forecast. So blue at three kilometers, brown at nine kilometers. And then the green and the red are when we take those forecasts and post-process them. We basically, all right, we're adjusting them based on the past bias. Um, the vertical axis is kind of a skill measure. We want that measure to be small, okay? Basically, the C there is cumulative, so if you can imagine the cumulative distribution function. It's really what is the observed CDF versus what we're forecasting, right? Observed probabilities versus forecast, and we want those to be right on top of one another, so we'd love for that to be zero, okay? So the take-home message here is, yeah, this post-processing, the red and the green, make a difference. We really improve our forecast by doing this post-processing, just basically incorporating in the past bias, right? This has nothing to do with, it's still a forecast. Um, but also the red and the green bars are pretty much the same bar. So we don't get any benefit to going from nine kilometer resolution to three kilometer resolution in this forecast. Um, if we look at specific humidity and temperature, the same type of thing, right? So we have raw three, raw nine, post-process three, post-process nine. So three and nine don't make a difference. Post-processing makes a huge difference. And then over here on this side, um, these three bars, the first bar, this big kind of purple bar with big tails is a model called the GFS. And what that is, is that's the model that we're using to initialize the WERF, right? The WERF is just over the Finger Lakes. I need to know what's going on to feed data into the model. So that's the big global model. So if I just use that, I'd be doing a really crappy job. I get a lot of improvement by running the high resolution model. And then these two bars at the end are this NDFD forecast that I get directly from the weather service. So that's their forecast. And even here, by running our own model, we can do a lot better in terms of forecast. So the, the bottom line take home message in this is the NDFD is eh, kind of okay. It's it, We kind of argue it's the same as if we didn't post-process our ensemble, but by doing the ensemble run and post-processing it, even at a nine kilometer resolution uh, helps out quite a bit. And you might say three, nine kilometers, what's the big deal? It's a lot of big deal in terms of the amount of computer power that you would need to run those models. I'm going to skip over that. Um, let me skip over that. The very last thing, um, one of the other pieces of data that we have in our database are climate projections. All right, so future projections from climate models and things like that. And I am like 
my battery's going dead. Um, so we've been working with the USDA, actually the, the Department of the Chief of uh, um, Economists, uh, to look at climate change indicators in agriculture. So this is a big national effort that, that we've been a part of. Um, our data set, our database fits in there quite a bit. So again, we're getting, have a number of downscaled climate model projections in, in our database. So here's an example of, of a high emission scenario. The downscaled data set is, is LOCA. Um, it's an ensemble average from the LOCA projections. So basically saying, hey, what is gonna be the change in seasonal degree days as we go out to mid-century? So someplace here in Ithaca, we're looking like we can gain about 1200 degree days in a growing season. Um, when we can apply this to any number of things. So one of the indicators in the, in the climate indicators report is actually frost risk in apples, um, frost risk in fruit crops, is more generic. Um, so we use the data first to get a handle on chilling requirements, right? So, and then on, on development. So an example here of actually some observed data for apple development from Poughkeepsie over the last you know, 20, 30 years. Um, so if we pick on say the full bloom dates here in red, um, back in 1980, it was about May 15th. And if we just kind of scratch our eyes and come down here, we're probably about May 1st or so. So again, a week or so um, earlier in the bloom date. And then we can go to the climate model projections and kind of see the same thing. So if I'm going from 80, but now out to 2100, um, you know, this is for a different spot. So the, this is out in Geneva, but you see a continuation of that trend and basically going from about May 7th, um, you know, almost half a month later into, into April. So that's, that's a big deal. Um, then we can take that and say, hmm, what is that going to mean for the risk of killing an apple blossom, right? As if the frost dates are getting later in the year, you might say, hmm, that might be a good thing, might be good for apples, right? Um, and really, again, in the, in the, in the end here, um, what we found out is it really matters where you are, okay? If you're in a place, and the idea here is that the black line represents the future, the gray bars and the dotted line represent the current climate, and it's basically the risk of getting 50% kill in any of these different stages of development. So if we look at a place like Asheville and kind of the fruit belt of North Carolina or Yakima in Washington, um, if we're out into the future, basically the black line is always below the dotted line and actually in most cases below the confidence interval of the frost risk in the current climate. So we're saying there the risk of frost, the risk of frost kill in apples is declining. Um, if we move up here to uh, Ithaca um, and we do the same thing, um, basically what we see is a different pattern. Notice now the black line is above the dotted line and it's still within the error bars. And what did we just do there? I have no idea. So the bottom line is a place like Ithaca the frost risk doesn't really go down in the future climate. And actually, and maybe not statistically, it goes up. And the reason why that is occurring actually has in Ithaca, the risk of getting killed by a frost if you're an apple blossom here has more to do with the variance of the daily weather as opposed to the average. Okay, so in all those other places, North Carolina, Washington, it's all driven by what the average temperature but here in Ithaca, it's driven by what the variance is. So in the Northern, and that's true in other Northern climates. So that was my second to last slide. So basically the idea of this USDA project is to really make these types of indicators living. You know, most of the indicators report you see, it's a nice PDF on the web and you say, yep, well, we did this in 2018 and that's where our data ends. We wanna make this kind of a living thing to show those trends going on through time and obviously do it with more, it, we are doing it with more than apples. There's you know, some insect me metrics for insects emergence, degree days, things along those lines. So I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. There was one, uh, maybe there was one quick question online uh, that I could uh, ask. Uh, and then after that, I'll bring the microphone. 
Um, the question was how are the growing degree days calculated? Uh, and it was a matter of uh, asking what was the base. Yeah, um, and, and the question there is, tell me what you want. It's, okay. it's, 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 it's dynamic. You, the, the base is not fixed. You can tell the web service what base you want um, above or below the base. If you want to use 8650 to have both, you can specify that. So it, it's designed to be very, um, very customized. Do, do they count just since the last frost or will they count before the last frost? Um, you have to specify a starting date. There is not an option to like have it pick the last frost at the, as the starting date. Yeah, that would be a cool, that, that would be doable actually to do. Well, Art, thank you very much for the nice talk. And in the very beginning, you talked about the downsizing from 25 kilometer to five kilometer. And the temperature, when you do downscaling, you mentioned about the elapses. And uh, so for the downscaling of precipitation, what, what, what do you take into consideration? Yeah, I, I don't have the, the, the radar gives me precipitation at four kilometers. That's the native resolution of the radar. So that's, we don't do any downscaling with the radar data. It's, it's the four, right with the models, we're kind of getting the models at 25 kilometers and we are downscaling it to five kilometers, actually four and a half kilometers. But with the radar, the radar is, is already giving us, that's the, that's the spatial resolution of the radar beam. Thank you. Or the radar product, I should say. Oh, yeah, very, very interesting. Um, now, RCP 8.5 has been widely discredited in the recent time. I mean, it's just an absolutely unrealistic scenario. Do you have plans to redo this for more realistic scenarios? We have this, yeah, all the, I, my, my okay. slide was just a bad choice of slides. That's fine. Island. But my main question was about uncertainty, and I'm very interested in how you, when you're dealing with uh, your clients, how do you get them to understand, you seem to be much better in meteorology than we are in other fields in, in understanding probabilities, risks, uncertainties. Do you have any specific strategies using these tools to help them to, to, to train or understand? Yeah, other than, um, again, with the, with the downscale data, we do have an ensemble of models. So there are actually 32 different runs. So you can get that ensemble spread. And, and as much as looking at that and trying to get them to understand that, um, that's that's basically the way that it's done, right? So you know, you have to think about the the uncertainty in the scenario, right? We're making a guess on what we're going to look like CO two wise in the future, and then we have the uncertainty in the models, and then actually even now, um, the same, you know, like I use the weather forecast as an example of tweaking the initial conditions. Well, now the climate models initial conditions are tweaked a little bit, so the same model has an ensemble. And really where that is useful is if you tweak the same model and get the, the uncertainty, right? that's, that's the natural variation in the climate, right? That's the fact that it's not the same weather every year. And then you can look at the difference between the models and that's just the biases in the models. So you can start to drill down on that aspect of things. But it's how they use it for decision making. It, it is, and boy, in anybody that I've worked with, I have to say that's more of a, uh, you know, especially with the extreme rainfall stuff that we've been doing, it's more a political decision than a, than a scientific decision. What their, what their level of risk averseness or not averseness is and, and that kind of stuff. Thanks. Yes. I didn't recognize you under the mask. <laughs> um, I've been talking with, with other people about rain shifting models. And one of the ways that might might be useful for helping people think about climate mitigation would be instead of giving them a temporal endpoint and saying this is the you know given the the degree of emissions here's the what we are expecting would it would it be possible with the current climate mechanisms the the tools that you have available would it be possible to instead say here's what we would expect with one degree above what we have now. And here's what we would expect at 
two degrees above we have now, because that would be really helpful for um, saying, here's why we want to try to stop to, to do all this aggressive climate mitigation. Does that make sense? It does. Um, my gut reaction is that would be that would be tough to do with the model because right the the two degrees is what the model is so i mean you can use model a and it might be two degrees warmer in let's say 2050 and model b might be two degrees warmer in 2030 uh, you know 2030 or 2070 or whatever so you have that kind of mismatch does that i mean I've seen people, um, again, but where I have seen people do that, and we actually did that in some cases with our apple risk, where, right, we were basically modeling apple risk really just based on a distribution of temperature. So we could say, yep, if the temperature got two degrees warmer, so we shifted over this distribution statistically and changed the variance, right, we could do that, then, then you could do that. So that would be a different approach to things, but I would think you would have to do it statistically. Does that that make sense? That's exactly what we did with those with those Apple results. That's not that's not climate models. We we were just if it got one degree warmer, if it got two degrees warmer, if if the variance increased by ten percent or decreased by ten percent, what would we get? And and then kind of say, yep, two degrees warmer is similar to what the models are going to say in twenty thirty. I have a, I have a last maybe you had a question also, Tony. Or? Uh, just a quick one a comment on i'm always amazed when they're showing weather uh you know and projected weather and they talk about the european model versus the geo what's the big difference and why can't folks get together and just you know mesh them together i'm just from a reading well, <laughs> well i just just you know look at the news on the web and you know why people can't get together right so i'll, right. I'll leave it at that I think there is a certain amount of actually a, of nationalism and, right. and kind of competitiveness okay. and things like that. But increasingly, all the big meteorological, I mean, it, it, the, 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 the European model seems to get a big thumbs up when we have these big East Coast oh, snowstorms. Yeah. It definitely does. You know, there is a bias it, it happens to be better at. But I mean, I can see there are many, many cases where it ain't the best model. Tomorrow, it ain't going to be the best model. I have a question. I would like to ask you to uh, forecast on the forecast, and maybe you don't have the answer. Uh, my question is, um, what do you think will be the improvement on the forecast? What will be the nature of it? Would it be better accuracy or a longer forecast in the future? And where will that improvement come from, according to your experience or maybe what? I think where the next kind of improvement step is is kind of in the, a longer forecast okay. uh, a forecast in somewhere between like 14 days and 30 some days that kind of three to four week period that seems to be where a lot of the effort is going i would say on the short term you know, i don't, I don't want to say we've done everything already yeah, yeah, I mean, if yeah, if you got more observations and things like that, yeah, you'd probably get some improvements and things like that in in that short period. But I really think, um, I really think you'll see some stuff going on there in, in that medium period. Um, a lot of neat stuff coming out with machine learning and artificial intelligence and things like that. In that, in that kind of period. Thank you very much. A round of applause. <laughs>